Five Live Formula One. Good afternoon and welcome to live coverage of Formula One. It's round 21 and it's back to Brazil for the Sao Paulo Grand Prix. The championship fight in the drivers between Max Verstappen and Lando Norris is still mathematically on. The team's championship is hotting up very nicely with Red Bull falling down to third after last weekend as Ferrari rise up to second behind McLaren who lead the way. And it's the penultimate sprint weekend of the year too. So just one practice session ahead of us before we get straight into qualifying for the sprint race and guiding you through all the coverage is myself harry benjamin alongside me is the former renault formula one driver jolian palmer and the bbc's f1 correspondent andrew benson jolian welcome back nice to see you nice to hear your dulcet tones good season we're having isn't it hello what a warm welcome harry uh, a brilliant season is i i think this is one of the vintage seasons and we're coming to one of the vintage races on the calendar as well the Brazilian Grand Prix is always great a sprint weekend's kind of fun at this stage on this circuit as well that you can overtake on so there's a lot to look forward to Sao Paulo into Lagos as a track though Palmer just over 4.3 kilometers it's uh, not one of the longest but it certainly throws up one of the more entertaining races that we see throughout a year especially if there's weather that comes into play yeah, I like it. There's there's a lot right about Interlagos. Firstly, you can overtake. There's a whopping long, curved straight, effectively, out of Yunsao, turn 12, at the bottom of the hill. You go up through a couple of flat-out easy left-handers and get to the centre S, turn one, where we see loads of overtaking inside or outside. And if you can't get it done, you can overtake down at turn four as well. So loads of overtaking opportunity. I used to quite enjoy driving it as well. It's got a nice flow to the place. The middle sector is quite tight and twisty, but the rest of it's open. You can take some curves, but you can't abuse the curves. I'm not expecting track limits to be a big talking point this weekend either. I, I like it. It's ticking all my boxes. I could think of one time, Julian, when you didn't like driving it. <laughs> oh, yeah, I, could, I know what you're talking about. That was when weather, the when, when weather played its part, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. In 2016, the, the race that's more known to be remembered for one of Max Verstappen's great recovery drives up to a podium, Lewis Hamilton comfortably won on the day, and Jolian Palmer retired into the back of Daniel Kvyat quite early on in a race that was, it was so wet, I couldn't see the foggiest thing and um oh it was it was a treacherous day Kimi Raikkonen spun on the straight he aquaplaned off it was my hairiest race ever in my career was here in the in the wet this circuit is I think the, the biggest challenge well one thing that makes it even more of a challenge this weekend is that I'm pretty sure the entire track has been resurfaced as well fairly recently so that's going to change the abrasiveness Andrew of it and, and throw up all sorts of unknowns for the drivers and just a reminder there's only one practice session to get up to grips with it yeah, we actually don't know what effect that's going to have. It will make a darker track surface, and that means that uh, it'll get presumably hotter, and the track temperature is 52 degrees at the moment. So that's pretty hot as track temperatures go. Uh, that's what often happens with uh, new track surfaces, which have a lot of bitumen on them, uh, sort of oily surface. Um, it has been sprayed, but I don't know how extensively. So we don't yet know what effect that's going to have uh, on the tyres this weekend. Uh, no, and what else is going on this weekend? What are you keeping an eye out for, Andrew Benson? Well, there's obviously the championship fight, which I think you undersold a little bit mathematically. It's come well, on, it's I, well after last after weekend, I don't want to. I, I feel like maybe I've been going too hard on it, so well, I, I don't know how to feel about it at the moment. Well, so it, it's pretty certain. It's not been confirmed yet, but everyone's pretty certain that Max Verstappen is going to have a grid penalty this weekend for taking an extra engine. Uh, we don't know yet. As I say, it's not confirmed by Red Bull. They're refusing to answer questions on it. Um, but a Dutch journalist called Eric van Haaren, who's very close to the Verstappen family, has said it's happening. So I'm sure Eric is right. Um, so that's at least five places back for Verstappen um, in the Grand Prix, not the sprint. So that gives Norris a chance to, first of all, beat him and second of all, not be taken out by him, as uh, nearly got happened in the last uh, two races. So there's that. Uh, meanwhile, there's been some action at Haas. Kevin Magnussen is unwell and he's been replaced for for today's action and therefore for the sprint as well by Ollie Behrman uh, who's going to race, be racing for Haas next year um, 
We don't know yet whether Magnussen will be well enough to take part in uh, Grand Prix qualifying later on Saturday or not. Yeah, shame for Magnussen. Uh, let's see if he can recover in time. Haas on a pretty good run of form at the moment. Now 10 points clear of RB. He's sixth in the Constructors' Championship. Well, here, back in 2022, that magnificent surprise pole for K-Mag, although it was uh, the sprint, uh, pole, sprint race pole, and then managed to... Uh, uh, did not convert that into pole for the Grand Prix. But let's see if he makes his way back. Oliver Behrman getting quite uh, a good run-up to his full-time debut next season when he becomes a full-time Grand Prix driver uh, next year for the Haas team. He's picked the right area to be a super sub this year, hasn't he? Ferrari uh, for, and Haas. He was at Ferrari whilst Carlos Sainz had his appendix out in, uh, in Jeddah and came in, did a great job. That was round two. Then is covering Haas, where Kevin Magnussen had a race ban and is sadly feeling unwell today. But it's, it's quite rare that if you're a reserve driver and you spend the year drinking coffees, wearing headsets, you just hope that in one of the 24 races you might get a chance. It's so rare that you actually ever do. And Behrman has been in the right position to have two and now three goes as a reserve driver. And he's coming on, on the grid next year, of course. But just even if he wasn't, uh, a fantastic opportunity for him to show what he can do again. Session has started, by the way. Blue sky above, sunshine is out. The uh, grandstands are already filling up quite nicely, and it's only Friday. FP1 then underway. Uh, you mentioned, though, just while we're on Oli Bear, we've had obviously quite a few young driver uh, young drivers getting the, the opportunities this year. Liam Lawson, Franco Colapinto, both performing well and getting those opportunities too. It, it seems like uh, for all this year has been great for the general track action. It's been a, a real boom for the next generation of drivers. And haven't they deserved it, really? They're, firstly, they've come in and they've done such a good job. Behrman, Lawson now in. Colapinto has stunned everyone, I think, with how good he's been. Um, it, They've all come in and done a good job. Kimi Antonelli came in, crashed the Mercedes on his second lap in Monza, but the first lap was exceptional, and he looks like a big talent on the grid for, for next year as well. And it comes up to the winter where no rookies came on the grid. There were no changes at all. The, the driver average age is getting a bit older. Experience was valued more than taking a risk on young talent. So I am actually really pleased that some mid-season changes have, have paid off and youngsters can get the chance to, to show what they can do. And yeah, like I said, Lawson's got a great opportunity with how he's kicked on and the Red Bull seat is still in the balance with Sergio Perez, who had a miserable week last week on his home, home race. And generally, Colapinto still might have a chance to, to do something still as well. The other thing worth mentioning, Harry, about things that might happen this weekend um, is beautiful sunshine in Sao Paulo today. Uh, but all the drivers have been talking about weather uh, yesterday on the, in the media day. So I suspect that the forecast is for some rain over the course of the weekend. And it does pop up um, quite, it can pop up quite quickly in Sao Paulo. And as Julian says earlier, when it does rain uh, here, then, you know, it, it uh, causes havoc and mayhem quite often. It certainly does. Uh, the sound you're hearing is Zolly Behrman on his first flying lap, uh, making his way towards the double right-handers through turn six and seven for you, into the braking zone, down through the gears, into the right-hander of turn eight, and in that tight and twisty middle sector, incredibly undulating as he then heads uphill towards the right-hander of turn 10 it almost arcs round never ending before you then come round towards the final uh, sector of this circuit towards Jim Sao into the braking area for the left hander there's a big bit of runoff area there in fact you can go down a little road and that's where Kimi Raikkonen I think had a little jaunt past the gates uh, back in 2012 I think it is Lotus and they'll to do a, a UE and come back onto the track for Behrman no such problems hits the DRS board the rear wing flap flies open at the back and across the line Behrman subbing for Kevin Magnussen for today puts it up into uh, second make that uh, already down to fourth because Piastri has just gone fast as head of Perez Ocon then Behrman so first lap times coming in thick and fast a bit more news apparently Sergio Perez has got a new chassis this weekend which is a sort of last chance saloon resort for drivers who are struggling um, which he has been for a long time. It's quite interesting to hear Christian Horner, the Red Bull team principal, after the Mexico City Grand Prix last weekend, basically saying, you know, we've done as much as we can for him, and there comes a point where you have to make a difficult decision, which is a fairly unsubtle hint that Perez's future is very, very much under threat at the moment. It was, it was pretty much 
as soon as he signed that new contract, wasn't it? Or the new contract, he had one or two average races, just dipping the form that he had earlier on when the Red Bull car was so dominant. And then, as soon as that was announced, you thought, oh, that seems a bit premature. And then the pressure just got up and up and up, just got heaped on. And now it seems like it's becoming too much for Sergio Perez. And last week in Mexico was a really... I mean, it was the worst possible case for him. Home race, or everything that he has to try and do a good job. Big crowd, a track that he does well at in the past, and it just seemed too much. Q1 exit, getting a penalty before he's even started the race, and then being in the wars with the man that's potentially replacing him for next year, as the rumour goes. As Charles Leclerc has a little bit of a swap through... Uh, Ferradura, the double right-hander. Yeah, big weekend for Perez. Has to perform and give something to to save that seat, you think. But is it... How much of it is this a mental game for Perez? Because, you know, Andrew says the last chance to has been on one for quite a while now. But equally, we know, Perez is not as bad as, as he's looking right now. We know he's a, he's performed better than that. You know, his first season alongside... The first couple of seasons alongside Verstappen wasn't terrible. Albon Radio. My headrest pin came out. Okay, understood. So Alex Albon saying my headrest pin came out. He'll have to pit, and he has pitted, Albon. That's the headrest pin. Basically, holds the headrest in place on the on the uh, the cockpit sides. So <laughs> that'll be flying out if he doesn't pit, which he has done. So back to Perez as Verstappen crosses the line, 113.8 on the medium tyre, which pretty much everybody is out there on, with the exception of Sonoda and Lawson. They've gone out on the soft tyre. Uh, fastest lap time at the moment is still Piastri at 113.478. But how much is this a mental game for Perez? Because he is a better driver than what we're seeing. He's not a driver that gets knocked out of Q1 consistently, is he? Or is it just is that the effect of being alongside Max Verstappen? Well, it's, it's part ability, and then the mental game takes its toll as well. So I think, firstly, Verstappen is probably the best driver in the field, and he's dominated for such a long time now in a car that has been the best in the field. It's not anymore, but Max is still doing a fantastic job achieving what he is in that car. And, you know, he's, he's absolutely blown away. Gasly, Albon, Ricardo really as well, who, who left the team because Verstappen was such a, a promising youngster at the time. And then Perez came in, but Red Bull had a big car advantage over most of the field, apart from Mercedes. Perez came in in a year where it was Red Bull and Mercedes at the front, and then there was a big golf. There's no golf anymore. McLaren have joined the, the party at the front. Ferrari are really good. Mercedes is still lurking there or thereabouts. And the whole field has shifted up. So if you're half a second away from a man who's trying to do his best to qualify in the top three at the moment, you're going to be struggling to make Q3. That's the reality. And then you struggle to make Q3. And because of that, the pressure builds. Half a second off in 2021 would have left him fourth, fifth on the grid. Would have been okay. Half a second off now, when Max can't go and take a, an easy pole, it leaves him out in Q2 on, on a sort of regular basis. Yeah, Journey's, Journey's just nailed it. So just these are the qualifying average deficits between Verstappen and Perez since he joined Red Bull. 2021, half a second. 2022, 0.284 seconds. 2023, 0.449 seconds. 2024.348 seconds. So he's actually doing better compared to Verstappen in qualifying this year than he was last year. And yet he looks a million times worse. And the, yeah, it's because he gets himself way down the field, you know, instead of being first and fourth, they're third and 14th or whatever. The field's compressed and it exposes all the other weaknesses in Perez's driving that the people like at the front of the field, like Hamilton, Russell, Leclerc, uh, Alonso is not at the front of the field but those quality of drivers they don't have the same weaknesses they're, they're much more rounded in terms of their ability so when he's down the field he ends up getting caught up in all sorts of things that other people might not get caught up in and he doesn't make the progress that the others might make in a better car you know he can't uh, move through the field as quickly as he's overtake he's not as incisive and so on and so on here's the sound of Sergio Perez going top of the times Nine On minutes cue. into this session. There we go. 
A, uh, another weekend then for Sergio Perez with pressure on his shoulders. And actually, as he comes through the centre S's, I think he's uh, just apologising there. I think it was one of the Alpines coming through, just uh, balking his beginning of the lap for the Alpine. But uh, Perez, a 1.12.0 to the top of the times on the medium tyre. Tenth, uh, uh, over a tenth and a half clear of Russell. Then Norris, Leclerc, Verstappen is fifth. Albon is sixth. Sonoda on the soft tyre has just put his RB up into seventh. Piastri, Gasly, Lawson is the top ten. I mean, on Perez, as Alonso comes across the line, they had a brilliant battle this time last year, all the way to the chequered flag for the final step on the podium between Alonso and Perez. Absolutely brilliant racing, wheel to wheel. And it was Alonso who managed to edge the gap in the end uh, as uh, Alonso continues on his way down uh, towards turn four. In all seriousness, that's actually a really good start from Perez. To go top, everyone in the, uh, the sharp end has done, in fact, everyone in the field has done two flying laps. Verstappen has, he's P6, six tenths away. Perez has done that and he's hit the ground running, which is as good as you can hope for when there's only one hour of practice. We're 10 minutes through and he's setting the pace right now. All of the, the, the whole field on a medium tyre, apart from Sonoda and Lawson in the RBs. So that is more encouraging for, for Perez. And overall, the fact that you can have a Red Bull out in Q1, you can have Oscar Piastri out in Q1, having topped FP3 last week, he then doesn't do a good qualifying lap in Q1 and goes out. It's just great for the sport. The competitiveness through the whole field means that driver talent and hooking it up at the right time is what counts. It's what we want to what we want to see. Yeah, three top five starts in the last 14 Grand Prix for Perez. No podium in a Grand Prix, at least, since China. The stats do not look good for Perez, who, after going fastest, comes into the pits. As Alonso puts his Aston Martin up into third. The sound of Carlos signs in the Ferrari. Race winner out in Mexico comes across the line and puts it eight fastest. Was Mexico one of Sainz's best overall performances as a Formula One driver? throughout um, a weekend yeah probably I mean he, he he was very good in all his wins have been good but that was the most dominant I think that he's been um, I think Leclerc was a little bit out of sorts uh, in Mexico for whatever reason but Sainz was fast obviously uh, got it on pole position then he was incisive in passing Verstappen and it, but it was also noticeable uh, as to how Verstappen's defence changed uh, from Sainz to Norris uh, but once in front a bit like Leclerc in Austin uh, he made he made the most of that race and took control of it took it by the scruff of the neck just on the subject of Fernando Alonso by the way as you said he just went third um, a couple of minutes ago Aston Martin have gone back to a floor specification that was introduced in Japan believe it or not which is sort of indicative of the sort of season they've been having basically they've introduced a series of upgrades to the car none of which have really worked um, uh, they have got a new front wing on it which they introduced in Austin but the, the floor that came with the new front wing, front wing in Austin is gone or at least it's certainly not being used this weekend when it was intended to be um, so indicative of how they're struggling with development and it's, I think it's interesting just one final point on the struggling with development thing I think there are two teams that have had a sort of repeating situation of bringing new floors to their car this year and them not really working or at least not working as intended those two teams are Aston Martin and Mercedes guess what they both use the same wind tunnel now that might be a coincidence or maybe not well, George Russell coming out with Collins to the build-up this weekend, saying this is probably one of the most inconsistent cars Mercedes uh, have ever had, or certainly he's uh, ever driven while being at the team. So uh, uh, while they were both having a great dice last time out in Mexico, it wasn't for a position on the podium uh, as Behrman crosses the line to go 11. Now, 47 minutes and four, three, two, one one seconds remain of free practice one this the only practice session because it's a sprint weekend so we will head straight into qualifying for the sprint a little later on and you can hear that uh, from on five sports extra from 25 past six just to bring you up to speed with how both championships look at the moment in the drivers championship the battle is still on norris managing to close the gap it's now 47 points between himself and max verstappen who tops the table charles leclerc a further 24 
behind. Then comes Piastri, Carlos signs the top five. And then over in the Constructors' Championship, uh, just 29 points now separate McLaren, who topped the table from Ferrari. Then Red Bull now down to third, ahead of Mercedes and Aston Martin, the top five. Then a really nice battle for sixth in the midfield. Haas, 10 points clear now of RB in seventh. Williams and Alpine separated by a few points down in eighth and ninth. And Sauber still the only team yet to get off the mark, looking to be another pointless finish for Sauber, which uh, would be, uh, well, since 2014 was the last time uh, they scored no points in a season for them as they uh, slowly and uh, continue to begin their morph into what will be Audi, with still one more seat up for grabs alongside Nico Hülkenberg next year. Russell hits the top spot, Verstappen with the lockup. Uh, that's not a f work. I don't want to take the flap out. So Verstappen just started a push lap. That was his third flying lap attempt of the session so far. Still sits down in eighth place. Had a front left lock up at the first corner and then washed wide at turn four. And he's saying he doesn't want to take the flap out. That's reducing front wing angle, which then induces front locking. So not very happy with the direction they've taken early on. Russell at the top of the times, encouraging staff for, uh, for Mercedes. A lot of drivers struggling with big moments at in these uh, these early stages Colo Pinto had a big swap through the the fast left-hander before Jun Sao which is called Magulio very for good the, for the Portuguese speakers amongst us and Carlos Sainz just drifted wide at Jun Sao at the uh, the final corner as well so busy circuit 15 minutes in Lots of small moments. You said right at the top that uh, we're off the back, of course, of increased scrutiny over these driver guidelines and, and Max Verstappen's quite aggressive defence and attacking, uh, of course, receiving two 10-second time penalties in, in Mexico last time out. You said here that this track isn't really so much of an issue in terms of exceeding track limits. But, of course, in terms of the driver guidelines here, Leclerc is approaching the corner now through turn four. What happened here a couple of years ago between Verstappen and Hamilton, a very similar incident, Verstappen forcing Hamilton out wide surely the way Verstappen's been talking in the build-up to this weekend if him, he, Verstappen and indeed Lando Norris end up in a similar situation I fully expect Verstappen to, to push Norris out on, off the track he could do that at any corner to be clear I, I was talking initially about setting a fast lap without going over track limits I don't think there's any particular place on this circuit it's, got, it's kind of abrasive bumpy curbs that rumble the car as they go over and it's not easy to keep traction I don't think there'll be a corner here where you can actually gain time by going over track limits. Sometimes that exit of turn four, you can sneak over a tiny bit, but I don't think it gains you anything. So I'm hoping that we're not going to see lap times deleted for it. But with the way that Max is driving it, if he, if he can force the issue at turn seven in Mexico as a, as a sort of overtaking chance slash threat to force someone off, there's plenty Ooh. of corners at this one. Hamilton nearly going into uh, the back of, I think it was one of the Ferrari cars. We're just riding on board. Live images that we're seeing with Matt, with uh, Lewis Hamilton coming through or into the approach of uh, Jung Sao, just having to dart left out of the way of the braking zone. Indeed, he had a bit of traffic on that entire lap, and he's coming to the pits at the end of it. It was a slow lap for Hamilton anyway. So I think that was a bit of a nothing moment, Lewis, in the final corner. It was a Ferrari, I think Charles Leclerc, that was. Uh, in the final corner, Hamilton pits. He then he actually did a speed up to attack the pit entry and now switches it off in the Mercedes. I don't think that was a, a fast lap anyway from Hamilton. Oh, no, but he comes into the pits with uh, just under 43 minutes uh, left. And I don't think it was a completely nothing moment. I think it, it, it definitely caught him off guard. Enough to raise a hand in the cockpit. It was a nothing moment in the pantheon of practice moments. It was actually both Ferraris side by side. Sainz had Leclerc on his inside. It was actually Sainz then that got in the way of Hamilton technically, but Hamilton was already on an inlap. And Sainz, if, if Hamilton was on a push lap, it would have been a bigger moment. But when you're on a, when you're on a slow lap, he should have got out of the way. I feel like sometimes the Ferrari communication in general is tripping over more drivers in practice than, than others and Mexico was a clear case of that when Behrman was kind of in the way of, uh, of Albon and then Sainz was in the way of Piastri in the practice sessions Sainz is going to sweep over the line the sound you can hear is the Ferrari engine jumping up to fourth on the lap that he started as he blocked Hamilton I don't think Hamilton will, will mind overly at that one
And you do hear people complaining about Carlos Sainz quite a lot in practice, don't you? Yeah, you do. It's the practice, you don't get penalised for, for impeding anyone, but it's just a case of what goes around comes around. It's just etiquette to be nice to other drivers and they'll be nice to you. And I do feel like when Sainz gets in the way of another car and they're told that it was Sainz, then they sort of feel, not again. Same, same sort of thing with him. On signs, do you think he's quite a good case of resilience in Formula One right now, looking at where his future is going, leaving Ferrari, of course, at the end of the year, having to go to Williams as, as the next best option, having lost his dream drive to Lewis Hamilton off the back of a brilliant weekend in Mexico, go back to Australia in the year and the comeback from the appendix, developing Ferrari to where they might be. But then he's not going to see or witness any of, of the, the trophies that may come with it. I think Science is a really complete driver, actually. I don't think he's got the, the pace. He doesn't have the pace, does he, of, of your top-line qualifiers, one of which is Charles Leclerc, his teammate. But actually, in Mexico, I thought that was his best ever weekend. He had two laps good enough for pole comfortably and then did a really nice pass on Verstappen, admittedly... Admittedly... Uh, Max didn't make it particularly hard for him at the time. But, uh, yeah, I thought he was driving really well. And it, it must be tough when you realise that you're, you're about to potentially not have a race, race winning machinery again. And he was desperate after Austin to, uh, to have that chance. And he took it when he had it in Mexico. He's, he's driving Ferrari with the help of Leclerc. The two of them are driving Ferrari towards the Constructors title. I don't know where. What's interesting is that actually in terms of qualifying pace, this is Sainz's best year compared to Leclerc. He's still behind him. It's 13-7 down. I've got it on my um, sort of on merit calculation. Your numbers might be slightly different, Harry. But the average gap is only 0 0.019 between them. And it's been more like... 0.13, 0.15, something like that in the in the years before that. But it's still Leclerc more often than not. It's still Leclerc who's won three races, not Sainz, you know? it's That's why they've kept Leclerc and why they saw Leclerc as their future. And that's why when Hamilton came on the market, okay, it was unfortunate for Sainz. His, he was out of contract and Leclerc wasn't, but there was a reason he was out of contract and Leclerc wasn't. It is unfortunate because he's, he's one of those drivers who's, as Jeremy said, he's not... In terms of absolute pace, he's not quite at the very, very highest level, but he's he's absolutely as close as you can get without being at the at the absolute highest level, Jolyon, isn't he? That's the thing. So, but that problem is that the top teams pick their drivers, and people like science, even ones like science who are as close as he is, they're the ones who get left out in the end. Is a is a fantastic second driver, very reliable pair of hands. He's 51 points behind Leclerc, who's having one of his, his the best seats of his career. I would say Charles Leclerc right now. Well, Science did miss a whole race weekend, and he missed a whole race weekend in which Leclerc finished on the podium. So there's some points in there for him. He's, he's had a great season, and what a coup for Williams to be picking him up in the, in the, the form of his life. He's a, such a consistent operator, and. I, I, with, all, with all of it, you wonder when what's going on at Red Bull and Sergio Perez is under big pressure. You, you think he surely won't be still in that seat at the start of next year. How have they not signed Carlos Sainz in, in all of this? How Red, Red Bull have got Max Verstappen, who's gone to the top of the times again now, having completed a decent lap. He came through the pits and presumably had a bit more front flap. They've got Max Verstappen under contract for next year. But they are in back to another head scratcher. As you hear Yuki Tsunoda have a big moment at Biko de Pata, turn nine, the tight right hander. They're in a big head scratcher for what on earth they do with the second driver, Red Bull. And I don't think they've got an obvious fix anywhere. But the reason, I mean, to my understanding, that they, they wouldn't go for a Carlos Sainz is because of the Verstappen factor, you know, the, 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 the friction within the team that might come as a result. The two fathers have both very strong personalities. They want a team. They want a strong enough number two driver who can be there to pick up the points where Perez is not, but not strong enough that they're going to cause Verstappen any headaches. OK, so who's your answer to that, to the first part? Strong enough that they're going to be there to pick up the results? Right now, I'm, I would take a punt on Liam Lawson. That is such a big punt. He's done six Grand Prix in his career. He's looked solid, but there's not, I don't think there's been a massive wow. I'm not, I like that he's on the grid, don't get me wrong, but we're talking about putting him into the lion's den. He could get, he, he could get massacred by Verstappen, bearing in mind the credentials that Albin, Gasly and Perez all had. 
before lining up against him you're feeding Lawson to the wolves if you throw him in there maybe it'll stick we've not had long enough to see that it definitely won't but it's a serious punt so you who would you put in I would, I would have put science in it's, a, it's an absolute no-brainer to me now the reason that they haven't done that is because of the beef between Carlos Senior and Jos Verstappen and the tension that came we're talking 10 years ago <laughs> you've got to forgive and forget a little bit haven't you 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 know this is the skill of a management of the team they, they, they do revolve around Max a lot, but I think you you give Carlos Sainz the shot and say, we're going to give preference to Verstappen, by the way. He is our guy. And surely Sainz would take a sort of plucky second fiddle to a three-time, maybe four-time world champion than, than head to Williams. I, I don't, Andrew, what would you do? I think Sainz would be the best driver for it as well, but I think... You see little signs with Carlos Sainz as to why they haven't done it. And you saw one in Mexico last weekend and in Austin the weekend before. There's a pattern between Leclerc and Sainz and Ferrari. When Sainz is behind Leclerc, he's always complaining that Leclerc's going too slow and he should get out of the way and he races him like in the Austin sprint, for example, when they would have been better as a team to go forward together and potentially go after Verstappen for the win in the sprint. Then when Verstappen's ahead, but Leclerc's catching him, he complains how unfair it is that Leclerc's making them push too hard, which is what happened in Mexico last weekend. And it's that kind of attitude, that, that willingness to try and force his way, force his you know, position, that Red Bull don't want as a, as a teammate to Verstappen. They want someone who's going to acquiesce to Verstappen's superiority. And I don't think Carlos Sainz, quite rightly, from a competitive point of view, I don't think Carlos Sainz would acquiesce. And that's that's their problem with him, basically. Yeah, I think you'd if you're if you're in Sainz's shoes, you'd take, you know, the, the sort of verbal second fiddle with the with the hope that you're going to do a Sergio Perez in the early rounds and be there enough to be close, and then try and not acquiesce for the rest of it because you've asserted yourself enough to be a 1.3 driver rather than a two driver. So that would be the mentality of your Sainz. If you're if you're Red Bull, though. I think it just kind of goes down to the fact that they really have little importance on the Constructors' Championship because they're going to finish third this year and they're going to finish a really distant third with how it's going despite having a runaway lead early on and still the runaway championship leader by nearly 50 points. The, the other thing that's worth bearing in mind as to, to questioning their decision is that there's a, every chance that Verstappen will leave that team at the end of next year. And if he leaves the team and they've got Perez or Lawson, does it matter? You know, in that car. And then they're signing, looking to sign somebody else. And maybe that person that they sign is George Russell, for example, if Verstappen goes to Mercedes. If Verstappen goes to uh, Aston Martin, then that's a different... No, he can't go to Aston Martin at the end of next year. That'll have to be the year after. Anyway, let's suppose he goes to Mercedes, who want him uh, at the end of next year. Then they've got Russell and Perez or Lawson as opposed to Russell and Sainz. And I know who I'd want in, a, in my team if I was using Max Verstappen as a lineup. I wouldn't, and it wouldn't be Perez or Lawson in the second car alongside George Russell. Yeah, that, and that's... And there's plenty of rumour that next year could be Verstappen's last uh, Red Bull as well still. So I, I do just think they've that management or lack of acceptance to take on that situation, it would be a bit of a risk in the short run, but having a second driver that can push Max might be a good thing as well for him we've not seen him be pushed in the same team since sort of Daniel Ricciardo back in 2018 and that was early stages of Verstappen really of developing as a driver I mean, he was quick from the off but you would imagine he has as improved as a driver since then oh, he's, he's improved remarkably hasn't he he makes very few mistakes his consistency is quite incredible he could deliver under pressure it, it, is this a, almost, uh, this is the Santa Hamilton going on a quick lap, by the way, uh, coming towards the, the double right-hander. Is this a kind of wider example of Red Bull's junior program has kind of fallen all out of whack in the last few years? Before, they were so quick, they always had somebody else coming up through the ranks and were willing to take that punt. But right now, they're clearly not seeing Sonoda as a guy that goes any further than where he currently is. It's the same with uh, Ayumu Owasu, who's currently racing off in Super Formula, because they're both more Honda aligned really than Red Bull Hadjar Isaac Hadjar is leading the F2 championship but there's more room around him not being quite ready for Formula 1 yet maybe a year as a reserve they haven't got many options within their pool anymore 
No, they, they, they've they got Hadjar there, second in F2. They've actually got a lot of options, but they haven't got any standouts from what I can see. That was Hamilton going to second place, sporting a nice Brazilian helmet for uh, for this weekend. I think I think you're right. They don't have any, they don't have a potential superstar from what we can see in their, in their ranks of Kimi Antonelli that they can thrust straight through. I'm, I'm surprised that Hadjar hasn't had a chance. Second in F2 was leading the championship. Really should be winning that championship. But they're not giving him a promotion at the moment. They've got Lawson there, who is who is doing a good job. Running sixth at the moment, ahead of Sonoda in, uh, in 14th in this session. They really could do with Lawson having some standout results. I mean, he had a fantastic re return in, uh, in Austin. But to be beating Sonoda in a head-to-head -head again would be, would be great for Red Bull, just to ease the pressure that one of these youngsters could be the real deal. Well, and, and to compound it, we know Christian Horner said, well, he wouldn't be doing his job if he wasn't looking into uh, Franco Colapinto and, and how great his results are. Here is Hamilton. Very right, quality, well, still bad. The lap that we had on board with Lewis, who jumped up to second within a tenth of uh, Verstappen, he was right on the edge of oversteer in quite a lot of places, and you can see him fighting the car on a set of medium tyres. We have a confirmed engine penalty for Max Verstappen. So that'll be five places. Just, just the five. Just an internal combustion engine at the moment. Well, a new exhaust as well, but that's allowed because he's within his allocation. And that only applies to the Grand Prix, doesn't it? It doesn't throw through onto the sprint. So there we go. That is the breaking news. Max Verstappen then with a five-place grid penalty, which will be applied for Sunday's Grand Prix. So the sprint unaffected. Verstappen currently tops the times with half an hour to go. A 1.11.7, less than half attempt separating him and Hamilton. Then comes Russell. Alonso Perez is fifth ahead of Sainz. Lawson on the soft tyre is seventh ahead of Leclerc. Albon Piastri is 10th, Hulkenberg, Colapinto, Norris is down in 13th ahead of Sonoda and Stroll, who is 15th, Esteban Ocon is 16th ahead of Oli Behrman, a surprise call up for Behrman today after uh, Kevin Magnussen has taken unwell, they're going to hope to get him back in the car as soon as possible, but if Behrman does take part in sprint qualifying later, he will also do the sprint race tomorrow, Bottas, Gasly and Joe finishing off the 20 runners on the track. And that lap that Hamilton did to jump to second was still on his original set of medium tyres. So they're hanging on OK with the, the high track temperature. 55 degrees track temperature. I'm speaking about it at the top of the hour. It's, uh, it's absolutely scorching with the newly resurfaced dark asphalt. And still the medium tyres are hanging on. So sometimes this, the general smoothness of the, of the newly relayed circuit would be good. Although we did hear Lewis also talking about poor ride quality, which would go against that. Either way, decent pace from the Mercedes, lining second and third. The McLarens, 10th and 13th. Very low key in the first half an hour. Yeah, running a, a new rear wing for uh, this weekend uh, from the uh, the documents that get supplied to us. So still continuing to chase those last tweaks and developments right up uh, until the end as we uh, well only have a few races left after this one. We go to uh, well, a two-week break after this before we head to Vegas, then uh, Qatar for the final sprint before we get to the finale in Abu Dhabi. Will the championship go down to the wire, Joe Lee Palmer? Chances are no, but you never know. I think last week it was actually huge for Norris to firstly get some points off Verstappen, obviously, after what happened in Austin, really just stifled his, his, uh, his charge, didn't it? But beating Verstappen, taking 10 points was really important. But also more than that, I think is twofold. Firstly, Verstappen getting 20 seconds worth of penalties is significant because I think the stewards have laid down a marker of you're not beyond reproach with some of your defence and we will hand out a double punishment if you do double crime. So I think for Verstappen that's got away on him a little bit and even just I think for Max the the fallout from it the extent that he was pushing the limits and his turn seven move was an absolute nonsense in Mexico and you feel like if he's driving like that and the, the, the pressure that's come on him having d resorted to those sort of tactics already you think surely He's already used that sort of joker card. You can't keep doing that with four races to go. And he's been punished for it. So I think mentally, then I don't know if Max has ever affected mentally, to be clear. But for most other drivers, they might think, oh, I've got to be a little bit cleaner now because this doesn't reflect very well on me how I'm driving. I wonder if the other impact, Jolien, is that Norris played him at his own game in Mexico and won this time. 
So, in, what I mean by that is in Austin, uh, Verstappen did his usual dive bomb defense. Go to the inside, so the guy who's overtaking or trying to overtake has to go to the outside and then tries to game the rules by ensuring that this is Verstappen, by ensuring that his nose is ahead at the apex, which, mean, which activates the driver guidelines in a different way. It means that, <clears throat> as the stewards interpreted it in Austin, that allowed him to force Norris wide basically because he was ahead at the apex therefore that's his corner according to the guidelines regardless of whether he was going to make the corner or not was the way the stewards interpreted it there whereas in Mexico Norris was ahead at the apex and that triggered a different guideline so actually although the incidents were almost identical they weren't absolutely identical and the stewards made that uh, distinction in the two verdicts particularly the Mexico verdict it was they used a different example as to why Verstappen was guilty as opposed to Norris being guilty in Austin but the point I'm trying to make is that so Norris made sure he got to the apex first there so I would think Jolien that might put doubt in Verstappen's mind about that defense will it actually work all the time or has Norris worked him out now Norris definitely charged him with more speed didn't he, he you could tell seven days on that he was way more committed to the approach to the corner and was was fairly hell-bent on getting to the apex first but also Verstappen had nowhere to go because if he had carried more speed on, on the way in, he would have actually wiped out Sainz in the race lead and it would have been catastrophic for him. So I'm still interested to know what would happen if Sainz wasn't there. I think you'd have had Austin all over again, personally, even though you could see Lando was trying to carry a load more speed in. It will happen again, won't it? Because that is that is how the, the guidelines are at the moment. It's all about getting to the apex. And we saw it with... Perez and Lawson and Perez and Stroll and Lawson and Colapinto and so many wheel-to-wheel -wheel battles were done on get to the apex, shove the guy off on the exit. Doesn't make for great racing, but that's the, the letter of the law at the moment of what the stewards are operating with. The drivers know it, so they're going to go with that. And it'll happen again with Verstappen and Norris, I'm sure. Well, one of the sort of wider uh, outcries from this always comes down to, to the stewarding and perhaps some of the inconsistency that can be seen across a season from from session to session sometimes with these kind of incidents but george russell was uh, was not the first person to to say this either about the idea of permanent race stewards how how much or how much of that can become a reality what is why hasn't it happened that yet? can do okay it, it can do but it, the, so the fia need to implement that um, george russell said this week and he's absolutely bang on that formula one should be ruled in the stewards panel it's the FAA look after this, not Formula One as such. So as a, the governing body, the FAA, need to appoint permanent race stewards, which I completely agree with, because when you have a revolving panel of stewards, I, I'm a former driver. I have different views sometimes to other former, former, former drivers. We all think we're sensible people. Maybe we're not all sensible people, but we all think we are. But different drivers have different opinions on like the, the nuance of each move. But if you have the same one there, they can explain the decisions and the, the minutiae of each incident won't change week on week. And I don't know about the, the stewards panel generally, but I don't know how invested they are in all of the incidents of the past. Some of them are uh, maybe not watching all of the incidents of the past and they're coming in for a weekend, they're coming in a little bit cold, making a snap call based on hunch and what feels right in the moment. Whereas if you have a permanent panel of stewards, then that goes out the window. Hamilton having a little bit more jiggery pokery is the sound you can hear there with uh, the back of Lando Norris trying to set up a flying lap once again. The other thing is the professional stewards. And this is what Russell was also saying. They're, they're volunteers at the moment, the panel of stewards, which is bizarre. This is a professional sport with so much money being pumped into it from all angles. It is one of the highest tech sports in the world. You talk about VAR in other sports and TMO, whatever it is. We have every angle covered for a steward's decision. But the stewards, they're not permanent. They're changing all the time, as they do in, in football and, and so on. But they're also just they're volunteers. Pay them a, a massive whacking salary. Make sure you get the best of the best in the game, like you have the best referees refereeing Premier League games and the juniors do your conference league. Make it so that they're, they're the absolute best. You can rely on them to make good decisions. It's a no-brainer. But I've been saying this for years. I spoke to Alex Wurtz in uh, Miami this year, who's been the, the boss of the GPDA, the Grand Prix Drivers Association, for many a year. And he said, trust me, 
I was saying this 20 years ago that we need to have this. It's always been the case in Formula One. For some reason, the FIA are not implementing it, and I've always wished that they do, and it makes complete sense. Now, George Russell's the driver's head of the, uh, the GPDA as well. Hopefully, there could be some momentum on it because we do need a better and more consistent judging panel of stewards. Would you do it? They got jo I think Johnny Herbert was uh, was one and part of the panel in Mexico. So obviously Alex Wurtz, as you say, would be a part of it for a long time. If they said Jolien, would well, you I think be up for I, it? I'd be interested in. I would be interested, but doing doing twenty four races is is a lot as well. So you've got to have whoever's need a bit on. Of a, 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 a solid rotation throughout the season. No, but, but I'm just saying you don't need the rotation. I'm saying you need permanent stewards out. But, but, but that's the problem. Nobody's going to commit to doing 24 but, but rounds. Why not? Well, hang on. Maybe you don't need permanent stewards, as in the same stewards all the time. Maybe you just need to have some kind of system that's halfway between what you're talking about. Maybe you could have a group of permanent stewards, which is what they have at the moment. But the issue isn't necessarily the, the personnel. The issue is the consistency of the decisions. So that's the, that's the, that's the question, isn't it? You just like in football you can't expect to have the same referee for every Champions League game or every World Cup game but well, they happen at the same time exactly it's one race sure but maybe 24 but as you say maybe 24 races is too much but so the drivers maybe, don't change no Niels but, Wittig the race director doesn't change no but most of the teams have changed their staff have a rotational system not all of them admittedly but most of the teams have got one now because there's so many races and because Grand Prix take up so many days so it, but the, 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 the highest paid staff still it, Pete Bonington's been yeah. doing almost every race with Lewis Hamilton for 12 years you could still effectively have permanent stewards if they were professional they wouldn't necessarily have to be the same people every single race is what I'm saying but wouldn't it be better if they were maybe I don't know but it must be because then you have the consistency. Well, if no? the other people are, invest are still invested in the decisions when they're not there and know and still follow the same principles, then why would it make a difference? Is, is there also uh, an issue here as well at play where we want decisions made before the end of the race? We don't want the time to be taken by the stewards to maybe check, well, what, hang on, what this previous season was very similar to that one. Let's just see what the penalty But that's was what there. a permanent panel would... If, by the They'd time you're doing off. all the races, you remember the, you know, what, what decisions are what. You don't have to look through the, the archives and find out that actually four years ago in Spa, this similar thing happened. You naturally pick up when you're, the, when you're a match referee or you're the stewards. But maybe you could have the, the permanent panel that sits remotely which makes it much easier. You don't have to fly to Japan one week and then on to Melbourne. Exactly. And why do they need to be at the race? So Even maybe you, you have argue. your your you have a supplementary permanent steward, like VAR, in fact. Like, exactly, exactly like VAR, and they they're not remotely in a in a warehouse somewhere near Sao Paulo. They're actually in FIA HQ somewhere, and they can make the decisions permanently. And you have your, your temporary stewards that go around yeah. and can deal with day-to-day -day affairs, maybe. And I do think Formula 1 gets itself in a bit of a pickle sometimes with some of the well-intentioned ideas that they get, which then, in, in actioning them, cause problems. So one example of that would be Abu Dhabi 21. Michael Massey made a catastrophic error and didn't put the didn't implement the rules properly in that late safety car period, but that was because he was under pressure or felt under pressure to get the race finished under green flag conditions, which was an agreement that the FIA had had with Formula One and the team principals before that. So he was trying to make that happen. He got it wrong in doing it, but that, it was, it was for the, he made the wrong decisions for the right reasons, if you like. And a similar thing happened in Austin. They, they're, they're under a sort of a requirement, not a requirement, but the, the ideal is to not change the podium for example we don't want one driver on the podium and then it turns out that he's not third anymore he's fifth because he got a 10 second penalty or whatever but when an incident happens so close to the end of the race there's a risk that the decision gets rushed and that was mclaren's argument in austin that they didn't think broadly enough about what actually had happened in the incident um in terms of you know verstappen's driving and norris is driving and what rules should have applied to in what way in this particular circumstance so you know, there's, there are more questions here than just the identity of the stewards and whether they're the same people every weekend or not. And I don't want to be critical on the stewards that are there at the moment because they have their their opinion on a racing incident. They try their best. So I'm not trying to make any disparaging comments on the stewards. I think they do a tough job. 
But when you are doing a handful of races in a year and you're not doing all of them, and like I said, each of them will have different, slightly different opinions on what is fair racing, what is an acceptable move, when should you have space, when shouldn't you have space. Largely, you can agree on the guidelines, and the guidelines that, that we're technically operating in were brought in to have consistency. But if you just have a permanent set of stewards and they can go, they can speak to the drivers, they can explain the decisions at every race and be open about it. Everyone knows what you can and can't do. And the drivers just need to know where the boundaries are and they'll race to them, as we're seeing at the moment. Certainly are. The, the stewards for this weekend, Gerd, Gerd Enza, Andrew uh, Malaliu, Johnny Herbert, Luciano Berti, former Brazilian driver. And that's uh, that's your four panels, uh, your four that make up the panel for the stewards this weekend. But uh, it's certainly, well, it's not an easy job. Hence the huge discussion on it. But let's see what unfolds this weekend. Uh, seeing quite a lot of uh, long run pace going on at the moment and simulations. Although George Russell, a few moments ago, did put on the soft tyre and uh, found more time. Is uh, fastest with a 110.791. Verstappen second. Hamilton, third, Alonso, Leclerc, the top five. They haven't ventured out yet onto the soft tyre. Lawson has and is indeed out there at the moment. He's down in 10th along with the other RB drivers, Sonoda. In fact, they went out right at the start of the session on the soft tyre. They're both in the pits. So Russell's the only driver that's banged on a set of softs and gone for an attacking lap. So far, second clear of the field. Verstappen and Hamilton still separated by next to nothing, both on the medium tyre. Pretty much everyone else has been bogged down in long runs. I'm guessing Andrew Benz has been too preoccupied with Stewart Stewart discussions to get into long run corner these days. But that's one of the things we've um, kind of been discussing throughout the season, Joey, is that these cars, this era of Formula 1... Oh, not Long Run Corner. Not Long Run Corner, no. It's on such a a knife edge as we're just getting a look at uh, Norris and Perez coming in almost side by side into the pit lane Norris I think fancied a move on Perez they slowed to the pit entry so Norris was actually following Perez for a few laps on their long runs and then wanted to attack the pit entry as well because you don't get many chances to attack the pit entry particularly on sprint race when the next time they do this is going to be sprint quality and then the race, the sprint, where you're not going to be pitting in the sprint, and then qualifying, and then the race. In practice, you normally get three hours, and you want to be attacking the pit lane, particularly somewhere like here, where you're building up high speed, and then you've got to peel off to the left and weave your way through a, a tight chicane and slow it down to your marks. You can win or lose crucial time there. So Norris fancied a practice run, and Perez was uh, was cruising into the pit lane, and obviously, if there's a car blocking your way, you've got to, uh, you've got to slow down. Uh, Hamilton uh, back out on track, still on the medium tyre, gathering uh, more and more data on that long run simulation he's doing. Of course, three-time winner here, three-time pole sitter, his hero, Ayrton Senna. Tribute paid to him on Hamilton's helmets. And, of course, uh, we believe that he is going to drive Senna's 1990 McLaren on Saturday, I think. And they were trying to keep that a bit of a secret, but it's got out there because you can't really keep a secret in this modern day age of Formula One. So uh, I'm sure it'll be another emotional weekend uh, for Lewis Hamilton. Coming round uh, the final corner now, taking a full pelt and across the line. Sparks fly from the underside of that Mercedes. Uh, about four and a half seconds off the pace now on that medium tyre sim. He's got Brazilian citizenship, yeah. hasn't he, Lewis Hamilton? Second home for him coming to uh, to Brazil. Well, it's also uh, the closest home race for Franco Colapinto, born in uh, Buenos Aires, Argentina. So he's had such a, uh, a huge sort of rise to Formula One fame now. And, and off of Austin, Mexico, he had so much uh, support from fans there. And I know this is maybe a little bit uh, of, a, of a null point, but I looked at his Instagram following the other day. He's got nearly three and a half million followers already. Alex Albon is nowhere near that. And I... I so he must be so a better must driver. Be good. But no, but don't you think... Obviously, he's clearly got some, some talent behind the wheel. But now... To have three and a half three million, million Instagram followers, followers how many, how many yeah. You, how many you got, Palmer? What's Instagram? Exactly. But... There's now interest. We know Formula One and, and the government in Argentina are now maybe wanting to push for the Grand Prix to come so back onto the calendar. Is this all signs that Colo Pinto is, is being pushed for an, uh, a seat next year somewhere, even though the options are very, very limited? Well, Colo Pinto should be 
Yeah, people should be looking at Colapinto as a serious option because Albin is regarded as a great talent in the midfield. He's done a great job against uh, Sargent and Latifi. I mean, he's made them look fairly amateur over the last few years and to the extent that they're both dropped and, and long gone. So Colapinto's come in and actually matched Albin fairly well. Mid-season, no, no testing, out of F2. They're fast and across the track everywhere. Hamilton's still struggling with ride. There are only three cars on the track at the moment. The sound you can hear is George Russell launching up the hill on soft tyres again. Hamilton is the other, and Colapinto is on an outlap on softs. I think we're going to get a load of uh, soft tyre runs at the end of the session, which will be interesting. But yeah, Colapinto, he should be in the mix for six. He's done a fantastic job. You've got to get an opportunity in Formula One to showcase what you can do. And when you do, if you can somehow achieve some good results in a short period of time, it makes everyone sit up. The only other thing is, isn't there a big rivalry, rivalry between Argentina and Brazil? Isn't this one of the classic rivalries? So well, even though this is the closest he has to a home race, this is like a, an away game for Conor Pinto, isn't it? It's like a Brit saying your German Grand Prix is, is your home race. It's, it just... Yeah, you, you make you make a fair point there, but I think overall the the sort of furore that Colapinto has gathered not only from fans but from inside the paddock is certainly it almost does it undervalue what Formula Two has has been doing this year when when the guy who was sixth in the championship not being talked about at all behind the two title protagonists Isaac Hadjar and, and actually Gabriel Bortoletto I'm sure we'll come on to in a minute is the one that's that's causing upset really up and down the grid as he as the Colapinto actually begins uh, begins a flying lap on the soft tyre yeah Formula 2 has been completely undermined this year it's like the, the F1 teams are just not looking at it are they you've got a rookie that's leading the championship who may yet get on the grid Gabriel Bortoletto Brazilian driver may end up in the Sauber for next year but then you've got Antonelli sick Behrman's coming through he's 15th in Formula 2 um, and as you said, Colapinto was sixth in the championships. They're not looking at the top of Formula 2. They're just thinking, ignore that. Who do we think is actually the best driver from what they've done before? Not a great state of affairs for F2. But hopefully the champion does get in. Hajar second as well in the Red Bull. Let's have a look at Colapinto on a soft tyre lap, shall we? Coming out of the uh, left-hander at turn A. Into Pico de Pato, turn 9. Slow speed corner, easy to lock up your right front. Down the hill, through Magulio, flat out before you pick the brakes for the uh, final left-hander of Jensau. Get on the gas, Colapinto using a little bit of curve on the exit, not too much. The Williams car looking fairly settled, but he is seven tenths away from Russell. Not finished below 12th at the flag in his first six Grand Prix. What can he achieve here? In FP1 with nine minutes left to go on the soft tie. It's a 1.11.6. Eight tenths off of Russell's fastest time in the Mercedes. So with eight minutes and 55 seconds left on the clock now, more and more cars taking to the track. I would expect to see, as uh, you said, Jody, and some soft tyre runs right towards the end of this session. The one and only practice they will get before we go into the first proper competitive se uh, session for qualifying for the sprint race. So not a lot of time, once again, to get up to speed. Yeah, we've got some big dogs on the track as well now so we are going to get an action-packed final eight minutes everyone having to dial in for qualifying pace and Carlos Sainz is the latest to start a flying lap his teammate had just started one but bailed out in the middle sector plenty of other cars out on circuit on outlaps Alex Albans just come through the first sector setting a fastest of all in the Williams and Carlos Sainz now heading down with the DRS open towards turn four to Ciro de Lago the bottom of the lake very good might be between the legs, I, th I feel like. Interlagos is between the legs. That's the one. I think it means, dis you know, the drop downhill at the lake, of the lake, it means descent. Descent of the lake. There we go. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. <laughs> Nicely saved there. Uh, the sound of Carlos. Lago Lago. I had Largo. You had Largo. You got an Interlagos, of course, famed for being between the lakes, which is, is one of the reasons, perhaps, this part of the world as well. We get such uh, quick changes of weather as well. We can quickly turn into it's a quite turbulent wind and rain here. The track became a lake, didn't it? A couple of years ago, just at the end of qualifying, Kevin Magnussen on pole. This is the sound of Carlos Sainz coming out of the final corner, using a little bit more curve than Carlos Pinto did, but he's three tenths down on George Russell. Still, Behrman goes up to second in the hats, matching Russell's time. That's impressive from Ollie Behrman. Sainz comes through, backs off over the line and jumps up to fourth place. He is a tenth and a half down on Albin, three tenths down on Behrman, and Russell, who still stays top 
It's shaping up to be one of those completely meaningless sprint free practice sessions, isn't it? They're all on soft tyres at the same time. <laughs> this it's, is qualifying. It's still better than FP2 last week. I will take this any day over a tyre test. The it was a tree has been wide in the centre S as well. This is going to be the sound of that. It was Oscar trying to line up his own soft tyre time. Gets through the left. Gets to an apex of the right, but just washes slightly wide and just rumbles over the uh, the edge of the curve onto the grass crete. Lost a bit of time. Certainly has his teammate Lando Norris though embarking on another fly. It's Russell with that soft tyre lap that tops the timings for now. Just 14 thousandths clear of Oli Behrman who had a so-so first sector but a good middle sector and a really good final sector. So Behrman straight in and up to speed here in the Haas replacing Kevin Magnussen for today at the very least and if he does complete the day today he'll do the sprint race as well tomorrow morning before Magnussen will then get another chance to try if he's feeling well enough to come in for qualifying for the Grand Prix. The first sector is literally just the centre S and a short straight into it and a longer straight out of it. The middle sector is where Lando Norris finds himself now. The twisty sector down through the tight left hand of turn nine up towards Bico de Pato, a small right kink before it throws you into a tight right corner, the slowest on the circuit. Accelerating your way over the blind crest of Magulio, flat out left hander, he goes around the Ferrari of Carlos Sainz who jumps out of the way and Norris is within two tenths of Russell but he's still down on the Mercedes man who bolted on those soft tyres quite a while ago now, opens the DRS to the line for Lando Norris Sparks on the underside of that McLaren third fastest still not quicker than Ollie Behrman whose time is holding up in second at the moment then comes uh, Albon in fourth science fifth here's Russell Radio my right elbow's getting caught on uh, don't take my right elbow is getting caught on some duct tape that's George Russell Pinnacle of Motorsport this, but nothing but a duct tape can't sort out, or in this case it's rather getting in the way for Russell. This is the sound of Alonso getting a nice little toe as well towards the line on the soft tyre in the Aston Martin, puts it up into sixth for the Spaniard. Yeah, beautiful slipstream. It's a long run out of the final corner over the line. It's uphill as well. And he had Colapinto just in front of him on that lap. Managed to help him up into the top six for the moment. Four tenths away from Russell. Behrman's time is actually staggering in the Haas. Up in second, matching Russell. Alkenberg's been through and he's six tenths off. So I wonder if Behrman's been given a little bit of engine mode or something to help him out. But even so, very, very impressive to be that quick. And Haas have had a great car recently as well. Consistently in the top ten, they are the fifth best team at the moment. Safely in sixth in the constructors. Behrman, he's got another chance at some points. Yeah, pass on for what could be their best constructors finish since finishing fifth in 2018. Currently lying sixth now, uh, a good 10 uh, points ahead of RB. So that battle ferociously continuing ahead of what will be an all-new driver lineup for them next year. As we say goodbye to Kevin Magnussen, the Hulk joins Sauber. Uh, right, Perez is out there in the Red Bull on the soft tyre. Indeed, everybody is out there on the soft tyre with the ex exception of uh, Hamilton who's still out there on the medium tyre and indeed is Verstappen, no Verstappen is now on the soft. He's just left the pits and he's on an outlap on the uh, on the soft tyre as well, down to 13th now because so many drivers have come through and improved on soft tyres, that's Verstappen's old medium tyre time. Hamilton also hasn't done anything on the soft and he is still on a medium tyre, so Mercedes with one car at the top, the other one not gunning it for a quality time. This is the sound on board Sergio Perez driving to the line, he's lost loads of time in the middle sector and he comes through 16th on his set of soft tyres one second off and just behind him Max Verstappen is getting ready for his own flying lap that was a rough middle sector from Perez. This is the sound of Hamilton a few moments ago, just trying to weave his way through the traffic. And this is something we're going to see more of in spring qualifying later. One, two, three, four cars he's having to weave his way through as he finally gets through them all on the way to Jin Sao. Yeah, he's still on a medium tyre and on a long run. Hamilton just not choosing to do a, a quality sim. And you could see the rear tyres just starting to go away from him more and more on that long, long run. 
Verstappen, finally, with two and a half minutes to go, is gracing the track with a soft tyre, and that's a very decent first sector. It certainly is. Made it through turn four into the left-hander of five, now approaching towards almost the back end of the pits as you come back on yourself around this anti-clockwise circuit. Verstappen, a two-time pole sitter here, a two-time winner, and now with a five-place grid penalty over his shoulder, that will be applied for the Grand Prix, so it's null and void for the sprint with the engine change taking place, but quick laps then coming in in these last two minutes. Verstappen, with all the quick times coming through, has fallen down to 14. It's a good first set, and let's see what it is coming up through the middle set, and he's nip and tuck with Russell at the moment, but a bit behind the Mercedes. Four hundredths down on George Russell. Piastri's just behind him on track two tenths down on Russell. I was going to say, let's see what grunt Verstappen has in the Red Bull up the hill over the line but you can hear he's backed off peels to the left and pits Piastri doesn't keeps his foot flat down in the McLaren and jumps up to fourth tidy lap from Piastri about a tenth and a half down in the end Behrman's time still holding up in second this is the sound of the Ferrari of signs going for another lap on the sauce but can't improve stays in sick ahead of Alonso uh, Leclerc is down in eighth now at the moment in front of Lawson and Gasly it's just seeing another moment from a few moments ago of Hamilton coming through the center S's and on the exit of turn two almost losing the rear having to correct the Mercedes as he then arcs his way through the left hander down the rest of Aposta towards turn four 27 laps all on the same set of tyres for Lewis Hamilton how much time have we got? Uh, it'll be one more lap when you cross the line. And he's done with it. That's not great for Mercedes. He's been talking about ride quality for the whole session. And I wonder if the car he's been fighting quite a lot, the, uh, the snappy oversteer we keep seeing on board with, uh, with Lewis, won't be making you feel any better. Probably over a bit of ride, especially with those rear tyres going on the long run. And now he's actually feeling it. This is not really what Mercedes won. No, but it'll get crucial data for what will be the sprint later. The sprint is 24 laps, so certainly gives them uh, something to uh, delve into in the short time they have between now and the sprint qualifying later. Uh, Leclerc comes across the line, just pips his teammate into six. Lando Norris, that's the sound you can hear on the man who sits second in the championship, chasing down Verstappen, blistering first sector, good middle sector, lost a bit of time in the final sector, but still takes the flag and goes fastest at the end of FP1. Still times to come through, but a one. 110-610 for Lando Norris over tenth and a half clear of George Russell. Piastri takes the flag as well in fourth. But that time from Behrman is is holding up very nicely indeed for the Haas driver. Yeah, British one, two, three in the only practice session we have been. I think that's everyone who was going to improve improving. Maybe Hulkenberg can jump up actually Behrman's teammate for the session at least comes over the line he's 11th he jumps up to 8th so Norris Russell Behrman not the three Brits you'd have thought would be in the top three Hamilton down in 16th and Verstappen an unknown backed out on the, his run to the line would have been there or thereabouts as well certainly the Haas cars looking strong then in these opening stages but it is only FP1, but it's the only one they'll get. And is it advantage Lando Norris? Well, certainly when it comes to the fastest times at the end of that session, finishing quickest. Russell second, Behrman third, Piastri and Alex Albon, the Williams, rounding out the top five. Leclerc and Sainz, sixth and seventh. Hulkenberg getting up to eighth on his final attempt ahead of Alonso. Pierre Gasly finishing in tenth ahead of Liam Lawson and Yuki Tsunoda. Colapinto, thirteenth. Bottas, fourteenth. Max Verstappen down in 15th. Hamilton didn't see what he had on the soft tyre but doing a long stint in his Mercedes in 16th. Stroll 17th. Ocon 18th. Perez who we did see on a quick lap time uh, but uh, lost a second in the middle sector in the end down in 19th. Only ahead of Joe Guan Yu in the Sauber. So that brings us to an end of FP1 running. And then Jody, and we go straight into spring qualifying. I like the setup of these weekends. There's no messing around. We're all left with more questions than answered, and we go straight into to one of the fastest sessions of the weekend. Yeah, there's merits in it, aren't there? I, I mean, I like an old school Formula One weekend, but I'm not adverse to a sprint in Brazil. It's a great racetrack, and we get two race starts and hopefully plenty of battles this weekend. 
practice starts being done on the starting grid. Actually, you'll have way more insight than I do, Jodie, on this, just on the, the starting grid, because it's it's not your usual starting grid, is it? it? Depending on where you start, you could be fe facing uphill or facing down and having to hold on to the brakes. It's one of the trickier ones. It's also a really short run to the first corner, but a difficult one because, as you said, you're, you're either on a small crest going up or down. It can be quite difficult. So the drivers are lining up on the grid right now, getting a feel for that. That was one bumpy ride. Wow. So we're only hearing that from the Mercedes drivers. Russell confirming what Hamilton's been saying for the whole hour. They're, they're actually both really quick, but it seems like it might be giving them a few bruises for the morning. And that was the sound of Russell's practice start. And then before you know it, you're into the left hand, downhill through the centre S's. Uh, well, then that just about does it for FP1 coverage around uh, this uh, Interlagos track. In the end, Lando Norris fastest ahead of George Russell. And Oliver Behrman subbing for the unwell Kevin Magnussen finishing in third. Next up, because it is a sprint weekend, we will go straight into sprint qualifying, and you'll be able to hear that in full over on Five Sports Extra. We'll be on air from 25 past six ahead of the session, going live at 6.30. So do join us uh, for that one. Uh, after Behrman, it was Piastri, Albon, Leclerc, Sainz, Hulkenberg, Alonso, and Gasly at the top. 10 runners. Uh, Jolien, final word from you. Who's going to be your pick for uh, pole in the sprint, please? Um, oh, it's Norris or Verstappen. Let's play it safe. Uh, let's go with Lando Norris. Andrew? Norris or Verstappen. What about the Ferraris, Jolien? <clears throat> Oh, I forgot about the Ferraris. They both ran soft tyres but weren't particularly quick. Yeah. I don't think it's going to be a Ferrari. I think it's Norris or Verstappen. Uh, yeah, I'm going for Norris. Very good. I will. What about the Ferraris? Then you don't say a Ferrari, Andrew. Leclerc second. All right, very good. I'll go for a Norris <laughs> poll, I think, for the sprint. Well, not long to wait until we get some answers. 25 past six, five sports extra for sprint qualifying. Thank you, Julian Palmer. Thank you, Andrew Benson. This has been an ING production for BBC Radio 5 Live.